Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Okay, welcome to Nanoscale Transistors. We're ready to dive into the course. I'm Professor Mark Lundstrom, and I'll be lecturing to you for six times a week for the next five weeks. Now, the first week is a little bit of review. Uh, some of you who have know a little bit about transistors and about semiconductor electronics, this will just refresh your memory on some key points. Uh, some of you who don't have an extensive background in semiconductors and electronics, what I hope to do is just to give you enough of the key concepts you can see that you'll be able to follow the rest of the course and the references that will be posted along with this lecture will point you some, to some additional resources that you can use to fill in details. So uh, let's dive right into things. Let me first of all show you a cartoon figure of what a transistor, a particular type of transistor, a MOSFET looks like. So it's built on a piece of p-type silicon, p for positive. It has an area we call a source, which is n-type, n for negative, a source of electrons. And it has another contact called a drain, which is also heavily doped n-type. And it has a channel in between. Now, typically what we would do for this device is we'd apply a voltage to the source, say zero volts ground. We'd apply a voltage to the gate, and we'd apply a positive voltage to the drain. A key part of this transistor is this thin insulating layer underneath the metal gate electrode. And uh, this, so this is the basic physical structure, and the whole point of the course is to get familiar with what's going on inside these transistors. A critical dimension for the transistor is the channel length, the distance between the source and the drain. Okay, now this is a side view of the transistor, a cartoon side view. The transistor has a width W coming out of the page. If I look down on the top of that transistor, I'm seeing the width W right here. And now I'm seeing my source contacts, my drain contacts, I'm seeing my gate electrode right in the middle and it has a channel length L. I don't see the gate oxide because it's underneath the, the gate metal. So that's what the physical structure of a transistor looks like. But in this, in, in this particular transistor is called a MOSFET. Metal, that's the metal gate. Oxide, that's the insulating layer underneath the gate. Semiconductor, that's typically silicon, but it could be another semiconductor. And field effect transistor is the name for this particular kind of transistor that we're going to be focusing on. Now in this lecture, we're taking a different view. We're thinking of the transistor as a black box. So I'm just saying, let, let's say we have a transistor and it's got three leads coming out of it. We apply voltages, we measure currents. How do we understand what we see? Because the whole point of the course is to talk about the physics about what goes on inside the transistor. But to warm up, we'll just get familiar with the terminal IV characteristics of the transistor. So we're thinking about this the way an electrical engineer would think about a black box. We have some device, we have some terminals, uh, one, two, three, sometimes there are four leads that come out. And the way we think about this device is that we have two main terminals through which a large current I1 flows. We have a third terminal that controls that large current, either by applying a voltage or by injecting a current. And sometimes there's a fourth terminal. That might be the silicon wafer that the transistor is built on. Okay. Now there are lots of different kinds of transistors. We're going to be focusing on one called the MOSFET. There are many flavors of MOSFETs. There are many other kinds of transistors. We'll mention one called the hemp later on. Many transistors operate on the same physical principles that we're going to be discussing. A few of them operate on different principles. And, you know, there are dozens of different kinds of transistors. We're going to be focusing on the most important kinds of transistors and the ones that are most widely used in practice. All right, so back to our bulk MOSFET. You know, this is a picture of a MOSFET of 10 or 12 years ago. You can see the four terminals, the source contact, the drain contact, the gate contact, and the body contact to the silicon wafer that the transistor is built on. Now it's going to be hard in circuits to draw diagrams like this, so circuit designers would use a schematic circuit symbol for the transistor. So here's the gate, the source, and the drain, and the body terminal. 
So if you see an electronic circuit diagram, the transistor will be represented that way. Now, let's think about this device. We're thinking about it in terms of its input-output characteristics. So it'll have two input terminals and two output terminals. Most transistors basically have three leads. So one of those leads has to do double duty if I need two input leads and two output leads. So one way to do that is to hook this up in common source. So now the input is between the gate and the source. It's the gate to source voltage. The output is between the drain and the source. So the, out, the source is doing double duty. It's the common lead between the input and the output, which is why we call it a common source. Well, we could reconfigure this as a common gate or a common drain. And circuit designers use MOSFETs in all three ways. Now we're going to try to get familiar with the current voltage characteristics, and there are a number of different ways that we can plot these current voltage characteristics. We could plot the current flowing through the two main terminals, the drain and the source as a function of the input voltage VGS while we fix the output voltage. Okay. Okay. I would call those the transfer characteristics because we're plotting the output current as a function of the input voltage. Now we could plot it a different way. We could plot the drain current as a function of the voltage between the drain and the source terminals while we fix the input voltage. We'd call that the output characteristics because we're plotting the output current as a function of the output voltage. Okay, so let's see if we can understand what the general IV characteristics of a MOSFET look like. So we know what the IV characteristics of a resistor look like. This is the simplest electronic device. Current is proportional to voltage. So the current voltage characteristics are a straight line. The higher the resistance, the lower the current. The lower the resistance, the higher the current. So that's the IV characteristic of a very simple device. Here's another simple device that electrical engineers like to use. It's an idealized device. This is an ideal current source. So we'll draw it this way. It has some ideal current I0. The properties of this electronic device are that no matter what voltage I apply across its terminals, I get the same current. We call that an ideal current source. Okay, now we can talk about generally what the current voltage characteristics of a transistor look like. They look something like this. These are the output characteristics. The output current as a function of the voltage between the output terminals at a fixed voltage and the input terminal. And you can see that for low voltages across the drain in the source terminals, it looks like a resistor or a linear region. For high voltages, it looks like an ideal current source. The current is independent of the voltage. So that's the generic current voltage characteristics of a MOSFET. Now, real MOSFETs aren't ideal. Uh, there's no such thing as an ideal current source. If I apply voltage across the terminals of anything, I'll get a little bit different current. It might look something like this. So I would model my IV characteristics as an ideal current source in parallel with the resistor so that the larger the voltage across these two terminals, I'll get more and more current through the resistor. So I'll have some slope to my IV characteristic. And indeed, that's what an actual MOSFET looks like. We have a smooth transition between a linear region to a region that we still call the saturated region, but it doesn't exactly saturate because it's not an ideal current source. So that's what an IV characteristic of a transistor looks like. The point of this course is to try to understand what's going on inside when the electrons and holes flow around and what's going on when the dimensions of these transistors get to be exceedingly small, which is what's happening today. Now, if I plot the IV characteristics, the one I showed you on the previous slide was just at one particular gate voltage. If I change the gate voltage, I get a whole family of curves. So this is what the output characteristics would look like as I sweep the input voltage from low all the way up to the power supply voltage. Okay, I still have my linear region. Down here it looks like a voltage controlled resistor. And I have a saturated region that isn't quite saturated, but almost, I will still label that the saturated region. Now, we're going to have to get comfortable with these different ways of plotting the IV characteristics. I've been showing you the output characteristics. Output current as a function of output voltage. Each one of these curves has a fixed input voltage. We could also plot 
well, one of the things I'll note here is that there's a key voltage here, this knee, this transition between the, between the linear region and the saturated region, that occurs at a critical voltage that we call VD sat. And you can see it's a little bit mushy. It's not a precisely defined voltage, but you can see about where it's happening in each case. Okay, now I can also plot the transfer characteristics. So I could fix my drain, my output voltage at either a low value or at a high value, and then I could plot the current as I sweep the, the input voltage. That's what we call the transfer characteristics. Output current as a function of input voltage at either a low voltage across the drain in the source or at a high voltage across the drain in the source. So the transfer characteristics would look like that. There's a critical voltage here too. When I apply a large enough voltage, the transistor turns on and current begins to flow. The voltage that I need to apply to the gate in order to make current flow is called the threshold voltage. Okay, so we're going to make a lot of use throughout this course in plotting back and forth between plotting output characteristics and transfer characteristics, and you should try to get comfortable with that. Now, one of the things we won't be talking about in this course are applications of MOSFETs in circuits. But I just want to mention that there are two main applications. One is to use this device as a digital switch. It's either on or off. Uh, that's like a one or a zero. So that's Boolean algebra. You can build digital logic using transistors this way, either turning them on or turning them off. The other way to use them is as an analog device. Put a small signal in, you get a big amplified signal out, and you can do audio ampli amplification, radio frequency amplification, or whatever. So we're not going to be getting into the actual circuits or our applications of transistors, but it's nice to know where these devices are used. Our focus is going to be on the device itself. Uh, one other thing that I'll mention here is that there are two different flavors of transistors. The one that I've been discussing has a source of electrons in the red region. Electrons drain out of the drain contact. The silicon itself is p-type or positive. So there's no continuous path for electrons to flow until you apply a gate voltage that's bigger than the critical voltage to turn the transistor on. And then there's an n-type layer that connects the source and the drain and electrons flow. Electrons flow out the drain. They have a negative charge, so that's drain current flowing in. Now, I could build the transistor in just the opposite way. I could build it on an n-type silicon wafer instead. I could make my source and drain sources of positive carriers or holes, so p-type. And then what I need to do is to apply a gate voltage that is more negative than a critical voltage. When I do that, I attract holes to the surface. There's a continuous channel of holes to flow from the source and the drain. Uh, holes then will flow out the drain, and that gives me a drain current that is flowing out the drain. So we have both N-channel and P-channel MOSFETs that we could make. Usually they're used in combination in digital logic or in analog amplifiers, and we call that CMOS technology, complementary MOS technology. NMOS is always paired with the PMOS and vice versa. Okay, so now to end, I just want to define some key device metrics, and you'll get a chance in the homework assignment to work this out for yourself. We'll be referring to these metrics over and over again throughout the course, but I just want to define them very quickly for you here so that you know what we're talking about. So here are the IV characteristics. There are a lot of things that I could extract from a measured IV characteristic. If you take the largest gate voltage, say the power supply voltage, and you look in the linear region, then one over the slope of that linear region would be a resistance. We'll call that the on resistance. Usually we plot the current in milliamps per micrometer of width, because if I want more current, I just double the width of the transistor. That means that this resistance would be in units of ohm micrometers. If I look at the largest current that I can get, when I apply the power supply voltage between the drain and the source, and I apply the power supply voltage at the uh, gate, we call that the on current. And its units are milliamps per micrometer of width. If I look at the slope of the output current, 
in this regime where it's supposed to be like an ideal current source, but it isn't quite, then one over that slope is the output resistance in units of ohm micrometers. And if I look at the change in the current as I change the gate voltage from one value to another, that change, that delta ID divided by the delta VG, that's the change in output current over the change in input voltage, that has units of conductance. It's called a transconductance because it's the change in output current per input voltage. It's a key figure of merit for how good of an amplifier the device is. We call it G sub M, and its units are typically measured in microsiemens per micrometer of width. Okay, now if I look at the transfer characteristics, I can define another set of metrics. So if you plot ID versus gate voltage at some constant uh, power supply voltage between the drain and the source terminal, you'll get a characteristic that'll look like that. The on current in this plot is up here, maximum gate voltage, maximum drain voltage. If you use a smaller drain voltage, you'll get less current. And if I extrapolate those curves down to the gate voltage at which current starts to flow, you'll see it's not a precisely determined voltage, but you can see roughly that current starts to flow at a value that I would call VT sat, if I do the extrapolation from the saturation region current, or VT lin, if I do the extra, ex, extrapolation from the linear region of the current. And they're a little bit different, and we'll talk about why. Now, if you look at this plot, which is on a linear scale, you'll see that there's virtually no current before you apply at least the threshold voltage to the terminal. But there is some small current there, and in order to see that, I would just redo the plot with a log scale on the vertical axis so that I can see that small current in the off regime. And what you'll see is that there's some small leakage current. If I apply the maximum voltage between the drain and the source, and zero volts at the gate, some current will flow. We call that the off current. Ideally, it would be zero, but it isn't. And these days, as we get more and more transistors on a chip, and they get smaller and smaller, the off currents begin to add up, and something like roughly half of the power that dissipates in your laptop is due to this leakage current when the transistors are supposed to be off. Now, there's some critical voltage at which we start to get some amount of current flowing when we say the device is now on. That's our threshold voltage. It was easier to see on the linear plot. Below threshold, the drain current varies exponentially with gate voltage. And there's a key parameter is the slope of that sub-threshold regime, or one over the slope. And we usually measure that. We call that the sub-threshold swing. We ask how many millivolts increase of gate voltage does it take to increase the output current by a factor of 10. That's called the subthreshold swing, and the units are millivolts of increase in gate voltage per decade of increase in drain current. Now, if I do this curve at a different voltage between the drain and the source, ideally I would get roughly the same curve. Actually, you don't. So if I have a smaller voltage between the drain and the source, I'll get less current but you'll notice that it's also translated horizontally along the gate voltage axis. That translation is a critical device metric for a transistor. That voltage translation is called Dibble, Drain Induced Barrier Lowering. That explains the physics, and we'll discuss what's causing this later on when we get inside the transistor. But it's measured in units typically of millivolts per volt. It's how many millivolts this IV characteristic has been translated in the x-axis per volt change in the drain volt, in the drain to source voltage. Okay, so that's a quick summary. For those of you that don't have a lot of experience in transistors, that's a lot to absorb, but we'll be seeing this many times and you'll get familiar with it. The, all of the terms have been defined. These are the key figures of merit. Uh, homework one will give you some real measured IV characteristics and ask you to deduce those figures of merit. But remember that our goal in this transistor is not to understand these devices as a black box, which is what we've been doing in this lecture. It's to go inside the transistor and understand the physics of what's happening inside. So with that, we'll conclude lecture one. 
and uh, good luck on the first homework assignment.